There we go. Now we're live. We are live. Welcome to Hashtag Bilingual We. My name is Heather Robertson Devine, and I'd love to introduce you to my co host, Krista Jimenez. Hi, Krista. Hello. How are you doing, Heather? Great. Hey, we're going to talk tonight about how hard it is to raise bilingual kids. Um, we're going to chat a little bit about how we became bilingual why um, high quality books are so successful to raising bilingual kids, um, and a few strategies that we're using right now to keep our kids bilingual. And then we're gonna show you how to become part of the Bilingual We community um, on social media. So let's get started. Um, Heather, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you learned Spanish? Yeah, so I'm I'm bilingual because um, I call myself a sequential bilingual, meaning that I first knew English and then through education schooling I learned Spanish. Uh, my first Spanish teacher, Senora Figueroa, was a wonderful Puerto Rican woman in my middle school, and she would sing to us and made Spanish come alive and and fun. Um, I continued to take Spanish throughout high school and then into college and. I thought I would, I really wanted to study abroad and thought I want to go to Africa. I've always wanted to go to South Africa. And then I realized, hmm, I speak another language. So maybe I should go somewhere where they speak that language. <laughs> so um, take it, take us back to 1998 when I studied abroad in Santiago, Chile at the Universidad Católica. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I really truly became bilingual. Um, I really arrived that and had awesome. no, I have no not been to Chile I'm dying to go. Yeah, it's, um, it's an amazing country. So They're now that you're people. bilingual. Yes. Um, so what does parenting and being bilingual look like for you? Well, so in my household, I'm the only one who's bilingual. So it's a little bit tricky for me. And um, when I was in the classroom, I realized that I needed to have a good model in the classroom and that good model wasn't necessarily me. So I was always looking for high quality Spanish text to be my model. And that is the same format I'm using at home. I, I use books as my resource and my models for being bilingual and to, um, stimulate conversation with my, primarily with my, um, how old is he? 15 month old son. Um, and so what is like, what does that look like when you're using the books? Can you give me like a concrete example? Sure. Um, so, uh, story time is story time. Um, most of the time, actually it's at night, like before bed. Um, mm -hmm. he is moving a lot, so he doesn't really enjoy, um, listening to me read to him. Um, it used to be a lot more actually, but way less now. So I actually have two times that are really, really concrete. One bath time. We do a lot of mommy, me, mo, mo, papi, pi, po, poo with our bath letters. And, um, so our bath finger puppets talk to each other in Spanish. For some reason, like the gatito is like, I can't even look at it without like changing my voice to be like, oh, cola, como estas, Tomas? Yeah, see? And then, um, and then we do a book before bedtime and I usually sing him a couple songs. I made up this Buenas Noches song um, that has some gratitude in it. And, and that's when we, that's when we sing. We also do a lot of um, role playing during like playtime too so uh, but it's yeah. it's a natural unscheduled event and does he is he starting to produce the language as a result of that so he's not really producing any he's producing very little language right now um, uh, he's producing like names of um, the dog specifically this is his favorite and um, ball uh, but that's about the you know, ball da ma ma pa ma da um, very very little language so um, definitely his receptive language is up there and um, it's 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 some in Spanish we also FaceTime with um, my Chilean family frequently that's so cool. that's also another time when he gets to hear it that's really awesome, especially how authentic, right? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and and we were in um, Chile in January, so um, he got to spend two weeks with his his cousins and his um, tios and tias and and everyone in the whole family. So we're really working right now, and I'm just focusing on his receptive language. So his production, I'm not really there and thinking about it too much right now. Well, we always, um, or I always say that just any any exposure to language is changing the way that the brain is wired to be thinking of language as something dual and not singular, which we fight in the classroom all the time. At least I have always taught second language, not always, but have taught second language learners. And the biggest part of the battle is making them understand that there's more than way one way to say something, <laughs> whether that be in our own language or in two languages. So mm-hmm. the fact that you're just getting those neurons firing in a few different ways is awesome. Yep. Yeah. So enough about me. Let's talk about you. Oh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, you're ready. Fire away. Can you tell me, can you tell me um, where you learned Spanish? Yeah. And when? So I took Spanish like you did. I guess I would call myself a sequential bilingual. Also, um, I took Spanish in high school. Um, it was not a great experience, um, really at all. It, Spanish did not make any sense to me. I had no context for it other than being in the classroom and conjugating verbs. Um, it was a really hard subject for me until I went to Guatemala on a service learning trip um, to build houses. And I've, I'm a musician, and so I heard the language like it was music. Um, and all of a sudden it just made complete sense that it wasn't all, it, it, it wasn't rules, it's the way people talk. And I just imitated exactly how everyone around me talked. And everyone thought I was really good at Spanish all of a sudden. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not what my teachers say. Um, so when I got back from Guatemala, I went into my sophomore year of college and decided to study Spanish um, as my major. And ended up studying abroad in Costa Rica twice and then living there and staying there for eight years and then marrying my husband, who is Costa Rican. Um, so our language together was always Spanish because he didn't he didn't speak English when we were dating or even when we first got married. So that's how I lived. Eight years. You yeah. lived abroad for eight years. Yeah. It was. I mean, I was back and forth because I was there and then finishing co- college. I would go study abroad and then come home because I had a marching band scholarship. And so I had to be um, in the States for football season. <laughs> and then when that was over, I'd go That's back funny. to Costa Rica. and Super, super gringo, like being yeah. in the States for football. Exactly right. From Nebraska. So um, I wasn't practicing my Spanish a lot <laughs> when I came home. <laughs> Other than, uh, well, this was actually before there was even really email or chatting or any of that. So it was like, a monthly phone call and we wrote a lot of letters to each other <laughs> while I was home. Oh my gosh. Remember the phone calls? They were like 50 cents a minute and then you'd have to like divide up your phone sheet and highlight whose calls were whose. Oh, jeez. Oh, the yes. days. Oh, the so days. You know how good they've got it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so your household is a truly bilingual household. Um, you and your husband are both bilingual. Is that correct? We are both bilingual, yes, but we're both sequential bilinguals in opposite languages. So my husband started learning English um, trial by fire when he moved here. So I studied Spanish literature um, and grammar and linguistics and all of those things where my husband has functional English. So he speaks English all day at his job. Um, He reads and writes it, but it's not something that he studied the grammar rules and and things like that. So... um, I would say we're a true bilingual household in the fact that we're both bilingual. Um, But we really strive to only speak Spanish at home. So we do what we call minority language at home. Um, Mm -hmm. And we only speak Spanish to our girls and to each other generally. (laughs) Sometimes I get a little lazy. Um, My daughter's like, mommy, I'm Espanol. But our daughters, um, I have my oldest daughter's three should be three and a half and my youngest daughter just turned one um and my older daughter she only spoke spanish for the first two years of her life she's a very verbal child um she's producing tons of words even at a year 
Um, we had a nanny that spoke Spanish and we only, I mean, we only ever spoke Spanish. With my younger daughter, it's a little different because I'm home full time. Um, and our older daughter started school in English. So she's wanting to produce a lot of English and show off what she's learning at school. So her literacy language is really English right now. Um, but my, the baby, she has six or seven words now and they're all in Spanish. Oh, except for oh, cheese. Wow. When we put a camera up to her face, she says, cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's not Spanish. <laughs> um, so it's inter awesome. I'll be really interested to see what, what her, if she's more truly bilingual, I guess, because she's been around both mm -hmm. languages, um, and what that will look like, like what their play language will look like as they grow, and um, and those types of things. Um, so can you talk? So you shared a little bit about how you and your husband speak um, in in Spanish at home. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about your, your instructional approach? So it sounds like your older daughter got a very natural approach to language. Mm -hmm. um, was there any intentional instruction in Spanish? And if, if um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your role as a, as the first, as your child's first teacher? Yeah, I think that's really, um, that's a good question. It was really natural um, and lots of books in Spanish. At the same time, um, when I was when she was first born, I was having a lot of trouble finding great book resources in Spanish for her that were at her level. So, a lot of our reading has always been done in English, um, which I'm finding as she gets older, her vocabulary through literacy, she tends to go toward English. Um, so it was very natural. Um, now we're working on specifically reading in Spanish, learning the syllables, learning the letters and their sounds, um, sight words, things like that. So she is getting more formal, I guess, instruction a few times a week for as long as we can stand it <laughs> um, in Spanish. Um, but then my younger daughter is always kind of around when that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. My older daughter, she reads out loud to us, but she reads in English. Um, but then we will watch all of the videos and um, do different activities in Spanish together. So I think maybe it's less natural with my younger daughter. I don't know. It's always a fight right now just to keep bilingualism because mm -hmm. um, my older daughter wants to speak English right now. She goes through periods. And of course, when I'm super tired, I don't feel like speaking Spanish. Um, or for example, my disciplinary language is English. I don't know why. I just when I reprimand her, which never happens because she's an angel, but if I were to reprimand her, right. <laughs> my all children are perfect. reaction. Yes, exactly. It's <laughs> mine. Um, but my knee jerk reaction is English. So huh. anyway, that's a little bit about kind of what it looks like right now. Yeah. Well, the exciting thing is we have planned that our next few episodes are going to focus more on our uh, go a little bit deeper into our situations and um, our instructional kind of focus at home with with our language. So um, so we'll get a little bit deeper as we go. But this that was a great um, brief overview of our experiences where we're from. Yeah. So now um, do you want to talk a little bit about some research? Because we're yeah. nerds, and this is one of the reasons yes, that we bond we together, because we love to read academic, <laughs> academia. Academia and research. Um, and actually, this piece is probably a little bit less um, science researchy based, but you'll find a link um, on our page to a Huffington Post parents um, article from the UK. So I love um, that international perspective about the language learning struggle of bilingual children. Um, and basically, like we both talked about, um, we speak Spanish, we use it, our kids are exposed to it, but the actual production or using of it or becoming bicultural or biliterate is a whole other issue in itself um, besides just exposing to language. Um, and so this author, um, Akei, he is basically asserting that unless you make language learning very and feel very exciting and fun, kids will tend to ebb and flow or maybe react negatively toward 
either the heritage language or the native language or, um, and his solution is really books, right? High quality bilingual books. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about um, his assertion that not just any translation of a bilingual <laughs> book is, is good enough and why that is? Yeah, well, um, getting too deep into this, uh, there, you know, and it, it, it reminds me, I, at some point, I'm not sure if it's appropriate here, but at some point it would be good to talk about my infographic on kind of my framework for thinking about books. Mm -hmm. Um, because his definition of bilingual books is a little bit tricky for me. Um, because in the United States we do have literally books with both languages in, in it. And so I, I reread the article a couple times thinking like, is, is that what he's referring to? Um, but really his, his, his definition, it just goes into say that they're books written um, with uh, bilingual children in mind. So mm -hmm. it could be a book with both languages in it, as well as it could be an, what I call an authentic Spanish text, a book that's written in Spanish, and they're generally from Latin American countries. Um, mm -hmm. but, but there are some that are written in the United States as well. Um, so I'm not sure if that really answers your question. Uh, he, for the most part, he's talking about books that are either what we would call quote unquote bilingual books with both languages in them or books that are written in Spanish um, and not translated. The, the value of having books that are not translated is, um, is, is, pretty, is pretty rich in terms of um, the embedded cultural diversity that is there as well as, you know, you talked about it when you first heard Spanish in a musical um, melodic way. And, and that's what uh, really good books do for, for really good kids books do is you read them to them and, and, and the language has a rhythm, a feel, um, a flow to it. Um, that rhyme and rhythm is, is something that um, you can only get from writing in that native language. Well, and I, you're right, absolutely. Um, so it's hard for me sometimes when when people say, "Oh, I found Clifford, and it's in Spanish, so I got it for your daughter," and I open it up and I yep. go, "All right, well, <laughs> culturally, this doesn't make any sense. Um, highways don't look like that in Latin America. This was a bad translation to begin with, um, you know." So anyway, so there's that, um, but there's also a piece of <laughs> <laughs> and this can happen is when I find a highways don't look like that. I just love that example. It's perfect. Well, we've been reading a lot of Clifford yep. lately. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> the big red dog. I just, I, and it's really funny that you bring it up because I just shifted out Clifford. I was like, I need a break from Clifford. Like I gotta, I gotta stop. And it's Clifford in the granja uh -huh. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so, but then there are times like we read um, Eric Carl's Oso Pardo, Oso Pardo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know in English, I didn't actually know it existed in English because we just had a Spanish copy. And the translation of that book is so excellent. Um, and the way that the rhyme comes across and the examples and the way that they've maybe not used the exact same example as they do in the English trans in English version, but they basically taken a book and made an English and a Spanish version. I think those books can be really powerful, especially when you can have them side by side. Um, with my daughter, she started to notice which books are in Spanish and which are in English because she looks for the accents. Kind wow. of so in contrast, and there's a lot to, that you can do um, when the translation is done really well. Mm -hmm. and that's hard hard to find. And I think there's a nuance there from what you would call authentic Spanish literature too um, in that some of that cultural knowledge and background of Americanisms um, is a part of our bilingual children's heritage. And it is important to pass that along um, as well. And when, if for an example, in my household we're not speaking any English so a lot of my culture isn't getting passed on and it is nice mm -hmm. to be able to open up a Dr. Seuss book that's really well translated and to feel good about reading that in Spanish but it's still being a piece of the um, American 
experience that when she goes to school, she won't say, I've never heard of Dr. Seuss, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She'll be able mm -hmm. to say, I read that, but I read it in my language. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question either, but. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't think there's really an answer, right? I right. think that it's, it's all about how you contextualize it in your household and how, how you want, I mean, how you want to. So, yeah, there's no answer. I think it's all about how we, how we can, how we frame it. Yep. And the richness of the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really exciting that your daughter's identifying the two different languages. It's a huge step. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I know. It's yeah. nerdy teacher mom and me. I'm like, yes, this is so great. Um, yep. It, it reminds me when I was uh, working with uh, fourth and fifth graders, I remember the day that the of a fourth grader looked up to me and he says, so like that L word, it's kind of like the, huh? It's everywhere. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> yep. Let's keep going. But yeah, let's think about that. If it, if it is the, let's see if it works, you know, and just that whole, yeah, it's great. Yeah. So, kids are phenomenal. Um, um, yeah. So, so I think, I think that, you know, in terms of like just a little summary about the article, I, I think that bilingual books are, um, are a great, are a great resource. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention about bilingual books is the regionalism piece of that. And you, and you kind of brought it up a little bit. The, the, the diversity in, in um, authentic books is really huge. Um, you know, I think about some of the books that I have, and it talks about having uh, uh, a woman who worked in their house, and like, you know, the having having domestic workers is a is an issue that, um, for some, it's the reality in Latin America, and for others, it is not the reality at all. <laughs> so, um, so you know, no book is perfect and all of the books are going to have some kind of different perspective. And, and, um, that's where it, it is all about the, the discussion of, um, your experiences and contextualizing it in terms of, you know, there's, there's very few books that I like, I don't carry any books by Costa Rican authors. And so, you know, that alone is, that. yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, a, that's another issue, right? Like, so, so you're they're gonna there is a whole nother dominant culture in in the Spanish book literature as well so, so 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 I mean that's a part of the diversity piece that um we just we have to consider well yeah and then there's another it could be too tangential but um there are so much great book so many great books that are translated from Portuguese in Brazil um mm -hmm. and because the languages are so close um, we will often look for, if we can't find real authentic Spanish literature at our library, or if we've read all the books, we'll start looking for translations from Portuguese um, because there's still enough of that Latin American flavor and the art and the words flow close enough that it's better than, you know, having a book translated from German, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, which which I think is also what you've just identified is that engagement piece. So you want the books to look and look and engage your children in a you know. Whereas there's some books that just aren't engaging, and you know you can't judge a book by its cover, but people do, especially kids. Well, yeah, <laughs> and there's also books that I really don't find engaging, and <laughs> we are reading every night. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> There's also that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so this is really our first, I guess, discussion of um, what will become our bilingual we community, right? Mm -hmm. of, of other people who are doing what we're doing in some way, passing on a second language for whatever reason to their um for their children. So can you talk to me a little bit, or not me, because clearly I know, but to our audience, um, a little bit about- Well, we didn't know we, other answers to questions we asked each other earlier, so that, you know, there's all fun, Strana. Let's, let's try this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> about how bilingual we came about and what, um, 
why we started it like you know how did yeah. our partnership form and yeah so um if my memory serves me correctly we connected via twitter we i don't know somehow uh you found one of my tweets or i found one of yours and and uh we started um communicating and uh immediately identified our nerdiness and um and and both of us being moms and uh well, so both of us being number one teachers, number two mm -hmm. moms, and number three incredibly passionate about being bilingual, especially being um, Spanish English bilingual, um, and uh, and our different approaches to it is mm -hmm. also really fascinating in how we can share um, our learnings and through our different approaches. Um, from that, we both discussed um, how we could collaborate, and um, you're doing some amazing blogging about your real life, <laughs> and um, girl, I ain't got time for that because I'm busy yeah. reading books and just sitting around, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Clearly. <laughs> So I mean, one of the one of our commonalities and, and the most common areas is and and kind of our I don't know for me it was definitely a struggle me me looking for that community to be bilingual and to talk about like how are you doing it and and your energy feeds mine and that's motivating so um, that's my perspective I don't know do you want to add anything to well probably where we're gonna go with it right yeah I mean it is I think any bilingual parent that I talk to always says, but I need more people. I need more resources. I need ideas. I want to reach out. Um, and the reality is sometimes we live in isolated places, so we, we can't find other native speakers or other people that are doing what we're doing. And other times we just don't have time. So I need to be able to get on yep. Twitter or I need to be able to get on Facebook and find other people and pose a question and get those answers. Um, but maybe I don't have time to meet <laughs> or to set something yeah. up. Um, and so I think we really decided that we wanted this bilingual community of people um, raising bilingual kids who have questions, who have concerns, who have ideas to be able to just come together in a really authentic way and engage in this discussion about what does bilingual look like at your house versus my house? What can I take from that and to modify from that and adapt from that um, with the end goal being that we enrich all kids lives with bilingualism right mm -hmm. um yep. and we'll start out by kind of looking at different bilingual models so if you're a new parent going i want to do bilingualism but i don't know how to do that we'll address that right so here are different models here are resources um, and then we'll go into really specific resources from your amazing library of books um, at Books del Sur and put our brains together and come up with just lesson plans, activities that can go along with those books, no matter what level of bilingualism it is. Um, if that means that you're learning Spanish along with your kids um, or from anywhere to you speak Spanish and you're, you're trying to introduce English to your kids um, or whatever your, you know, the dominant languages, if you live in France and you, <laughs> and you speak Spanish, whatever that looks like. So I think, um, that's really the goal is just to have a community to engage in these conversations in a very um, academic, <laughs> but still um, tangible or concrete way <laughs> that'll help our kids. Yeah, practical. Yeah. Practical. You know, and it reminds me, I, I my first teaching partner in elementary school, so third teaching partner in my career, um, <laughs> did reach out to me. I want to say it might have been a year ago now, maybe six months, and said, "Hey, what kind of blogs do you read? Or is there a bilingual parent community?" And I said to her, "No, create it." And she's like, "Yeah, like I got time for that." So <laughs> when when I met you, and I was like, and I and I'm going through it right now and living through it, and I'm really isolated here in in, in my small town. Although I met a mom tonight, which was really exciting. We spoke Spanish for a while. Um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I need that and I need it to be living in a space where I can go to it when I need it and, and not feel super obligated towards it because sometimes I don't sleep at night because my son's up. Like he just was five minutes ago screaming, which, sorry, I was a little distracted because I was like, why is he awake right now? Um, but, you know, like something that, that is um, living uh, online so I can have access to it and, and a resource I can go to because 
you know, your energy feeds my energy and it motivates me. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to meeting more people. Yeah, that's going to be the best part. So we wanted to make it really simple. Um, and we're both kind of nerds. <laughs> We've already mentioned this a million times, but social media, we love social media. We created this um, hashtag bilingual we um, just because we're bilingual and that looks like many different things. So we want it to be super inclusive for all bilingual parents, future parents, foster parents, adoptive parents, whatever type of parent you are, grandparent, fostering this bilingualism. And we want it to be searchable across all media. So if you prefer using Facebook over Instagram, over Twitter, whatever your medium is, hashtag everything that you post about that relates to our discussions or living bilingual as bilingual we and the rest of us can um, engage in that conversation with you. The other piece of this is you mentioned I have a blog and I do. Um, it's called Pura Vida Moms because of the Costa Rica connection. And all of our, um, all of these blogs and our resources and links to articles that we're reading um, will be housed on that website. Um, so you can always come um, visit us there and pose questions, um, write comments, any of those other things. And actually, if you go there right now, you'll find um, links to both Heather and I's um, social media accounts, um, links to the article that we just mentioned, um, and an overview of each um, each week's episode. So, And it's puravidamoms.com. Yeah. That's the website, puravidamoms.com. Yep. And you can dot search com. the hashtag, hashtag bilingual we. Yep. So I think that that's about wraps it up for tonight, don't you, Heather? Yeah, I was kind of wondering if I want to screen share the, the website. Oh, yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Is that kind of over the top? No, definitely. All right, all right, here it is. <laughs> It's right here, people. You get a load of this. It's beautiful. Putavidamoms.com, and this is the Welcome to the Bilingual We. So it's right under, right now it's housed under bilingualism, but um, as soon as you see it, it'll be in the side column on the main page. So, um, but you can also just just search Putavidamoms.com, Bilingual We. Um, it's a beautiful page, and um, here is the the landing page, and from here you can you can go to all the episodes. Yep. Perfect. <clears throat> so um, it is late in our world, and um, <laughs> I think p pat ourselves on the back for a first episode of success. Um, we recorded yeah. this, and um, we're, we're we haven't yawned at all, so that's pretty great. <laughs> I'm really impressed with myself. I'm not <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might be the yeah. best thing I've done all day. <laughs> Training rolls. Uh, <laughs> so our next episode. Can you give us a Krista, can you tell us our next episode is focused on? Yeah, so we're going to be looking at um, one parent, one language household. So what it looks like when only one parent is bilingual and uses that language all the time. Um, we're going to be looking at a couple of resources. One of them is the Mama Lingua app, um, which will help the parent who is not bilingual to reinforce the minority language. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some great research coming up on that too. Um, but I don't think we've decided exactly which article we're going to use yet. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah, for one parent, one language households. Great. Great. Can't wait. Okay. Um, thank you. And check us out and use the hashtag, hashtag bilingual we.